Who here is a storyteller? One last time, going once, going twice. Pretty good. Almost everybody. I didn't see very many hands down at all. You're CEOs. You're the face of your organization, the evangelists. People would expect that, I think, and you guys are probably pretty good at it. What about the CFO? How many people here have a storyteller CFO in their organization? Wow, okay, I can count this. Maybe five. Okay, so this is a good start. That's what I want to talk about today. Today I'm going to talk to you about the storyteller CFO and the non-storyteller CFO. What the difference is and what the advantages are to potentially having a storyteller CFO on your team and ultimately some ways to enable your CFO to be a storyteller or maybe you have a storyteller CFO already who's just bogged down to enable them to be a better storyteller CFO. And ultimately, how that person can, in the right role, can drive value in your organization. So what does a CFO do all day? Any idea? Excel. Excel. Excellent, yes. A lot of Excel. They're like closing the books every month, every quarter, every year. They're usually smart, they're hardworking, um, but they're seen as the gatekeeper, as the chief administrator, as kind of like the organizational plumber. If you're selling your house, that's, you know, you expect the plumbing to work, but that's not what drives the value. The CFO cuts down trees, fills binders with like financial statements, lines them up behind their desk. That's what goes on over there. And if you know, you're lucky enough, you're not gonna have to go near them that often. But they're responsible to know all the detail in those books. What is the story in those books? There's a story in there. And if you're a growth stage company, you probably want to know about cash. The story about cash is in those books. Do you have enough cash in your bank? Are you going to be able to make payroll? You know, is it in the right bank account, in the right company, the right amount, in the right currency at the right point in time? Are you collecting enough cash? Is bad debts in line or not? This is the story in those books. So yeah. The CFO is educated, he knows a lot of accounting rules and tax rules. He's probably pretty smart, you're talking to him, you're not really sure what he's saying, he puts up these eye charts with lots of numbers in Excel, <laughs> not in PowerPoint. <laughs> he closes the book, does taxes, says no a lot. When my kids ask, I often say, like they say, so dad, what do you do? So oh, I do grade three math all day. And it's, you know, it's basically adding and subtracting. Occasionally I do multiplying and dividing, some fancy stuff. But you know, when you do that business model in the back of your napkin, it's usually pretty good, right? You hire the team from McKinsey, they show up, they fill up your biggest boardroom for a month, cost you way too much, and get to the same answer. So great thing math kind of works, right? But for both of those models, for the McKinsey model and for your model, all the numbers came from the finance guy in the corner, the CFO, all that work he did, his team put in. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't know those few key numbers. You wouldn't be able to get to your story, nor would McKinsey. You need to be smart to be an accountant. It's a challenging role. You're doing all this stuff, you're doing it over and over again, you're always trying to get better at the same time as you're like staying on top of all the rules that are changing constantly. I used to work for a, uh, a fabulous silicon company north of Toronto made graphics chips. You guys probably know those guys. Um, sold to AMD a few years ago. Um, it always amazed me. There was like a huge irony. So you had these really smart PhD people walking around doing minor miracles for a living on a daily basis. It always astounded me how complicated a microchip was and that all that intelligence could fit on the tip of my fingernail. But yet, whenever I had them into my office or I was over in their office talking about budgets or like double-sided accounting, it always blew them away. They were like, that's way too complicated. And then I'd get into my grade three math story and I'd walk back to my desk and go, wow, I can't believe they think this is hard. But it must be really hard if they think it's tough. So I just, there's a lot of smarts in your CFO. But you can clearly see why there's a stereotype the know, the detail, 
not knowing how to present, not, how, no, not getting to the story. When you have him in the room, giving you all the backup and how they got to where they wound up, but not starting with the punchline. So you're in there for half an hour when it could have taken 30 seconds, right? They didn't get to the story. Has anyone seen that new series on Netflix about the CFO? <laughs> no? Come on, you didn't see that one where they close the books, everyone in the street looks up, an array of light comes down from the finance department, and everyone goes, hallelujah. Right, there isn't one. It's just not that exciting. But if your CFO stops there, he's like, got one chapter of the story. So did Harry meet Sally? Did the Death Star get destroyed? Did the rebels get away to live another day? That's the next chapter. Your CFO can't stop there. Your finance team shouldn't be allowed to stop with the binders on the shelf, with the boring spreadsheet. They gotta get you the story. There's a story in there. Clean audit, great tax structure. You're expecting this. But is that aligned with the biggest goals in your organization? At some level, yeah. Who here is, the, like, is their number one objective a clean audit. Again, no one, right? Who cares? It's revenue, it's growth. But here you got a high paid guy sitting in a, you know, in a desk close to yours, and they're not contributing directly to your number one objective. I say, they can if you let them get to the bottom of your story, really get them in there. And if they're not properly aligned and not working towards your highest level objectives, they're not doing their, they're not telling you the whole story. They're not doing their whole job. Their staff can do this stuff that, or maybe you don't have enough staff, there's that too, but anyway, they're not properly aligned. I think they should be aligned. And this is where we get to the storyteller CFO part of the presentation. Who here has ever invested in a mining company based on the P&L alone or the balance sheet alone? I'm not even gonna ask you to lift your hands because the answer's gotta be no. No one invests in a mining company because they put $100 million in a hole in the ground. And that's what the financial statements will tell you. You invest in that mine because there's gold at the bottom of the mine. That's not in your financial statements. That's another part of the story. You guys are tech guys, I'm a tech CFO. It's the same thing. So imagine me in front of an investor, a potential investor, and I say to them, okay, we lost $10 million last year. We want to lose $20 million this year and into perpetuity, cut me a check. You're like, what? Forget it. That's not the story. The story is, how am I gonna make money off of that? And that's where SAS math comes in, right? So SAS math, you take the financials, you combine it with unit, unit like sales, customer data, and you get to, oh, lifetime value and cost of acquisition and you know, churn rates and all this other stuff. And then the investor's eyes start to sparkle a bit, right? That's interesting. Is that enough? Or is everyone happily satisfied? You, maybe. I'm not satisfied. You can take that story even further, and that's where the real storyteller CFO shows up. You know, you guys all want to be Midas when you're in front of a potential investor. You want to take his 10 bucks and convince him you're going to turn it into 50. So you start with his ass math, and that gets you a deal. You're pretty happy with it. But what if you could get a better deal? And that's where you start talking about the full story. So not only start at the top, well, start at the top, but go underneath and get the real data and find the real story. And so this is, this is what I do as a storyteller CFO. I've done this almost every place I've ever been. More recently, it's about Salesforce. That's like kind of the popular spot right now. How do you get your cost of acquisition down? I can take all the Salesforce data, working with marketing, of course, you can't do this on your own as a finance guy, they get a little suspicious. <laughs> Combine it with the finance data. Plot out where your different conversion milestones are. Figure out your conversion rates historically, go back in time, predict what's gonna happen in the future. It's not rocket science. You don't need AI to do this. You just need someone in there combining the data, instrumenting it properly, and taking a look, it's like low-hanging fruit. You don't need a data scientist. You can get your CFO and the finance team can do it because it's pretty much what they do all the time. It's just going the extra step. It's taking 
the building blocks underneath the SAS math and making the story come to life. I do it in collaboration with the sales and marketing team all the time because then this is like the cherry on the top. So the finance guy, what's he gonna do with this? He's gonna get a better cash forecast? Yeah, that's important. But the sales and marketing guys, they can take this data, this combination of data, and use it weekly, daily, reduce the cost of leads, allocate their spending to the right lead channels, tailor it, reduce the cost of acquisition. I mean, imagine if you brought down your cost of acquisition, you could sell so much more for the same amount of money. So sales and marketing's happy, I'm happy, I get a better revenue and cash forecast, and the CEO is happy. You guys are gonna get a better valuation. You're gonna get lower dilution. You're gonna get a choice, raise more money or less. That's why you need a storyteller CFO. Last part, four things to enable your storyteller CFO. One, ability. Most CFOs are pretty close to there. Sometimes they just need the tools, the time, the encouragement, the collaboration across the organization. They might already be there. But there, you know, the accounting skill set is, is very important with this, but you also need a little bit of the skill to collaborate. And sometimes finance people aren't all the way there. Sometimes with training, it can get them there, but you need to have that ability. You can't be you know, going to marketing and demanding in their information or sales or what have you. You've got to slowly prove to them the benefit, work with them, collaborate. It does take time. You can't be the doctor no all the time, like finance, the other part of this accounting stereotype. <laughs> you gotta actually be constructive and deliver data-driven ideas. And that gets me to the tools. So, you, you guys ever, you remember that commercial where the guy bought the razor company? Okay, more hands? This time there's hands, right? Yeah, okay. So every place I've ever been, I've pretty much done this. I, I would get IT to give me a team, I'd hire my own. We build a data mart, we started grading data from all over the place, slamming against the finance data and getting to the story. But you cannot do this in your GL tool, you can't do this in Salesforce, you can't do this in any, like, there's, there, up until recently there would be IBM, SAP, Oracle, those guys could do it, but you know, again, you'd have to, you know, spend millions of dollars to get it in place, give up your biggest boardroom for a far longer period of time than a month, and it's just really expensive. But now it's, it's getting cheaper. And uh, you know, I was doing this, and then I got the call about this role at Vena. One of my buddies was the chair there. And uh, I was like, whoa, the time has come, it's here. Now, I don't have to do that anymore. And so, to the point, it's a lot easier to do the ROI to get the tools to the finance guy to do this now because the tools exist. And they're far easier to use, far cheaper than they have ever been. And uh, that's why I came to work at Vena. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't afford to buy the company like the Razor guy. Time. It needs time to make this happen. And as a CEO or a CFO doing this, you have to have patience. You gotta get everybody on board. You gotta get all the data together. The data is gonna be crap. You're not gonna be able to link it together, so you gotta fix it and re-instrument it. You're probably not collecting the right data. I don't know how many of you guys collect all the data off your platform and try to unite that with your Salesforce data, but it's a lot of work. I don't know if you remember maps earlier on, you know, you type in an address and you would get some weird address. Now you can type anything into Google. Yeah, that, we're back in the very early days on, on getting your data to match up. I don't know if AI is gonna help there, but uh, it's, <laughs> it'd be great if it would. Just match up my data. Last, CEO support. And this is where all of you guys come in and all of you guys can help yourself. If you got a CFO or maybe you have an accountant sitting over there um, I don't know. If you had a storyteller CFO, you could accomplish a lot more. If you had a finance department that could really drive the information into the hands of your other departments to drive value, you'd all be better off. That's, that's my <laughs> humble point of view. And the last point, expect more. Most people don't expect that from their CFO. And my final slide take home question for you all. Should I get a CFO, storyteller, CFO tomorrow? That's it. <laughs>